electrolyte changes in diabetic ketoacidosis. The major electrolytes that we are bothered about is the sodium and potassium. And in diabetic ketoacidosis, you can get hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, hypernatremia, hyponatremia. Now, these conditions happen in different stages of the disease. Correct identification of the level and correlating it with the state of the disease is important to understand the pathophysiology and to initiate appropriate treatment. So, let's take all the cases one by one. Hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is rarely seen in diabetic ketoacidosis. Whenever there is metabolic acidosis, whenever there is excess of hydrogen ions, the hydrogen ions get pushed intracellular and the potassium ions from the intracellular component come to the extracellular component. So there could be a chance that in the early stages of diabetic ketoacidosis, you may get hyperkalemia. Now remember that this is a very transient state and whatever excess of potassium is there gets filtered by the kidney. So eventually you get into a eukalemic state. So if a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis presents with hyperkalemia, assuming there are no other causes of hyperkalemia, then you could think that it is in the early stages of diabetic ketoacidosis. Most of the patients will be having a normal potassium level, but if the potassium levels are low, then we should realize that this is a case of a chronic long-standing diabetic ketoacidosis or metabolic acidosis. Now what happens is that all the hydrogen ions are being pushed into the intracellular component, the potassium is coming out, whatever excess of potassium comes out is getting filtered by the kidney. So there comes a state where all the intracellular potassium levels get depleted and they are not able to maintain the extracellular potassium levels. So if your patient with diabetic ketoacidosis has hypokalemia, it is a long standing diabetic ketoacidosis. Now the implications in the management. If the potassium is high, just start off with insulin. Insulin push the glucose inside along with potassium, so both of them get taken care of. Very rare to happen. Usually what happens is the potassium levels are low, are normal. A normal potassium level would indicate that there is some amount of intracellular potassium depletion. So you start an insulin with a potassium drip simultaneously so that as the glucose gets pushed inside, the potassium also gets pushed inside and maintains the intracellular potassium levels. If the potassium level is low, then starting insulin will further aggravate the hypokalemia. So here first treat the hypokalemia with potassium and then start the insulin treatment. Sodium. Hyponatremia is the most common feature that you would see in a diabetic ketoacidosis and the hypokalemia occurs on two accounts. The first account is which is uh, because of osmotic dilution of the serum. This hyperglycemia the increased blood glucose level exerts an osmotic potential and draws more intracellular fluid into the extracellular compartment. This causes the extravascular expansion and decrease in the sodium levels. Usually it is found that there is about a 1.6 milli equivalents per liter decrease of sodium for every 100 milligram per deciliter rise of blood glucose level. So either the lab issues a report which is a corrected sodium or the clinician evaluates the sodium levels in this light. But there should be a clarity that when you evaluate the sodium levels of a diabetic ketoacidosis patient, some amount of correction has to be made for the glycemic blood glycemic levels. Hyponatremia can also occur in another condition which is called matrix exclusion effect. Now what happens is that there are two kinds of electro uh, electrolyte analyzers in the lab. One which is called the direct ISC, ion sensitive electrode and one which is the indirect ISC. Most of the labs usually have indirect ISC. The arterial blood gas analyzer which also gives the electrolyte levels perform, works by the direct, uh, direct ISC. Right. So what is the difference between indirect and direct? In indirect, the plasma or the serum is diluted and then we estimate the electrolytes in the diluted version. Supposing I am taking 10 microliters of plasma, most of the diabetic patients usually have uh, dyslipidemias, usually very high triglyceride levels. So supposing a patient's triglyceride levels is 300-400 milligrams per deciliter. Now the lipid component is quite a bit. So when I take 10 microliters of serum, 
the the lipid component could may account for up to 3 to 4 microliters so effectively the volume of serum which i'm using the aqueous phase of the serum which is being tested by the ise method will give you a sodium which reflects the sodium of that 7 microliters of aqueous phase of the serum this is because the lipids have increased and they are not containing sodium right you estimate the sodium in 7 microliters of serum and extrapolate the data to 10 microliters of serum so you artifactually get a low sodium level this is called matrix exclusion effect when we use the direct ion sensitive electrode method the dilution factor doesn't occur it just measures the sodium in the aqueous component irrespective of the non aqueous component and the sodium you get over there is accurate so one really needs to know that when you are interpreting a sodium level interpret it in the light of what is the triglycerides and the lipid levels and if you find that these levels are high the report of the sodium which you get in an ISE uh, indirect ion sensitive electrode will be slightly lower than what the actual sodium is and the results of the sodium and the potassium that you get on a direct ion sensitive electrode as in an ad, ad, arterial blood gas analyzer will be more accurate hyponatremia very rare to occur excess osmotic diuresis could cause extreme dehydration and in that case you may get an element of hypernatremia